Hello friends. Thank you for joining us today. You might notice that we've got a little bit different background. We are at the beautiful New Life Ranch in northeast Oklahoma. You can't see it, but there's horses out in the field behind me. There was two bald eagles, eagles in a tree just over there. I wish that they were still there. We'd probably put the camera on there, but we're definitely out in God's creation and God has uh, put it on my heart, something very, very important to share with you today. You know, um, one, of the, one of the most vital parts, most important parts of our Christian walk is our prayer life. And today I want to talk to you about prayer. But how can I talk to you about, about prayer unless we have prayer? So let's open up with prayer. Father in heaven, you're a good God. And I thank you today from out of here in your creation that you would speak... Uh, uh, to my heart and then through my heart to others, Lord. I know that you have a word, so we're praying for the Holy Spirit. Teach us to pray, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Open up your Bible to Acts chapter 12. Acts chapter 12. I love this story right here because it gives us a picture of what happens when we pray. What happens when we pray. A lot of times we think our prayers don't ascend past the ceiling. But friends, I want you to know when we pray, you're not wasting your time because God hears your prayers. Acts chapter 12 and verse 1. Now about that time Herod the king stretched forth his hands to vex certain of the church. And he killed James, the brother of John, with the sword. And because he saw it pleased the Jews, he proceeded further to take Peter also. And when he had apprehended him, he put him into prison, and he delivered him to four quadrants of soldiers to keep him intended after Easter to bring him forth to the people. So Peter was therefore kept in prison, but prayer uh, was made without ceasing unto the church, uh, by the church unto God for him. But prayer. You know, there's two words that changes everything. But and prayer. Prayer changes everything. Friends, have you ever had one of those sleepless nights? You know, a night that you just, um, you couldn't go to sleep. You just tossed and turned and back and forth all through the night. Well, Miss Colonel Gacy was having one of those nights. She just couldn't sleep. Uh, she just tossed and turned. And so she was impressed to roll out of her bed and she got on her knees in prayer. So she rolled out of bed and she got on her knees and she prayed and she prayed. She got back up off her knees, got back into bed, but that dark cloud was still there. Still there. She couldn't understand why she should be, you know, uh, so uh, dark and, and down and out and discouraged. If anything, she should be joyful. Her husband had been away for, for months now on business in England, and he was on his way back. As a matter of fact, he was on his way back on a beautiful cruise liner called the Titanic. <laughs> the Titanic. Little did she know, little did she know as she was praying that her husband was... Uh, in the in the in the the on the in the Titanic on the Titanic in the North Atlantic and it had hit an iceberg, and little did know is she know as she was praying that that the that the boat had listed over and her husband had been thrown overboard into the icy waters of the North Atlantic, and about that time as she was praying a someone had threw a life preserver to her husband and rescued him. An amazing testimony of prayer. Friends, blessed is the man that has a woman that's praying for him, that has a wife that's praying for him. Blessed is, is the child uh, that has a parent that's praying for him. And blessed is the, per is the community that has a church that, that's praying for the community. There is power in intercessory prayer. I love this picture here that the Bible gives when we pray. It, 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 God's just not idle. When we pray, God, God, it gives God permission to act. When we pray, it brings God into the equation here. And so let's read a little bit more of this story, picking up at verse 6. And this is what happens when God's people pray here. And when Herod would have brought him forth the same night, Peter was sleeping between two soldiers bound with two chains... And, and the keepers before the door kept the prison. Now we learned earlier that there were 16 soldiers guarding Peter. Peter was in a mess. He was in a bind. 16 soldiers guarding one person. Was, was, was Peter that bad? Was he that, was he that dangerous of a, of a prisoner? No, I think God allowed this to be painted this way so that we'll know that not that Peter was so bad, but our God is so big and he can rescue people even when they get impossible, in impossible situations. Um, 
And, and not only was Peter in a, in a very bad situation, but it, if you study this, uh, this scripture right here in the context of everything going on, it was really bad for the church also. Things were not going good for the church. This little church that had just formed was in a bad situation. You know, we just got through reading James. Well, one of the leaders, one of the, one of the disciples, one of the twelve ha, had been killed. And now Peter, one of the leaders of the church, one of the early leaders of the church was going to be killed. It was looking bad. It looked like that Satan was going to have his way with the church and just totally snuff it out. So it was looking really bad. But friends, something very powerful was happening because God's people were praying. They were praying. And then the, the Bible paints a picture in verse 7. And behold, an angel of the Lord came upon him, and light shined in the prison, and he smote Peter on the side, and he raised him up, saying, Arise up quickly, and his chains fell, fell off. And, and the angel said to him, Gird up yourself and bind up your sandals. And so they did. And he said to him, Cast your garment about you and follow me. And he went out and followed him. And, he, and Peter didn't have a clue where he was going or what was really going on or even knowing if this was really a dream or not. But it says, When we were past the first and second ward, they came into the iron gate that leadeth into the city, which opened, them, uh, opened up on its own by itself and walked out free onto the, to the street amazing what's happening right here this is a beautiful picture here of what happens when god's people pray it's almost like you could picture the command post in heaven friends i want you to know god cares about you and he cares about what's going on in your life and when you pray what happens a channel is opened up for god to work we, we're we're told there's ministering angels all around the throne room of God just waiting on the mandate of Christ to go and work in behalf of those people that lift up prayers. And you can almost picture that happening. God wanting to work in Peter's life. God wanting to work in the early church's life. And, and as soon as those prayers were lifted up, it gave God permission. And Peter was rescued by that angel. But that was, that was no little thing, friends. But one thing I want to bring up here also is about the church. The church was in bad shape here. And, and don't you know that there was no little stir after Peter come, he come walking back up to the house and he knocked on the door and uh, the lady was so shocked. What were they doing when Peter knocked on the door? Well, the Bible says they were still praying. They were still, verse 12, that they were still gathered there praying. But it shocked the church because, because the little lady that Rhoda that answered the door says, uh, she, she heard Peter's voice, and then she went back and she said, It's Peter. And they said, Oh, no, it can't be Peter. <laughs> it can't be Peter. Friends, I want to bring this point out here. The, the, I call this the little, uh, the, the shaky faith house church. The shaky faith house church. Friends, they were just praying. Because it's all they could do. It's all they had left. It was looking bad for the church. But this little shaky faith house church started praying. And when they prayed... God worked a miracle. And I want you to know this miracle probably was just like a shot of B12 in the church. It probably fired that church up. I'm sure they, they, that rumor was spreading around everywhere. Hey, we were in a bind. Peter was going to be executed. But we prayed for him. And God answered our prayer. And, and He rescued him. This, this excited the early church, and I'm sure that it's one of the reasons the early church went out with such boldness to the whole community spreading the gospel. Friends, maybe, maybe you have somebody in your church. Maybe you have somebody in your family that's in an impossible situation. Maybe, maybe, maybe they're hanging around a bad crowd just like Peter was. He had 16 people he was hanging around. They were not a good crowd. And, but, and, and maybe they've got some, maybe they have found their self between a, a rock and a hard place. Maybe they're in a humanly impossible situation. Friends, all things are possible with God. All things are possible. We know that when we pray, it brings God into the equation. I like to say when we work, we work. But when we pray, God works. It gives Him permission to work. Maybe God, maybe God wants to cause a revival in your family's life. Maybe, maybe God wants to cause a revival in your church, in your, in, your, in your church family's life. He's just waiting on someone to come to Him in prayer. And there is power in corporate prayer. When God's people come together corporately praying, it moves the heart of God in, in a powerful way. I'm really impressed by this story here, and it's one of my favorite stories there is. And, and I, I want you to know, I, I thank God. I was, I was kind of like Peter. 
I was in a, I was in a bad uh, situation. I was hanging around the wrong crowd. I'd made a lot of decisions in my life that were not really good decisions. And because of that, I found myself really chained and shackled. I was a prisoner to my compulsive habits. In other words, I was, I was a slave to drugs and alcohol and lust and, and all these other things of the world. Had a grip on my life. But friends, my wife began praying for me. But not only my wife, but she enlisted other people to pray for me. And as they prayed for me, I could almost picture the, uh, God sending an angel down to, to my house and asking me if I could study the Bible. That's right. Somebody drove up in my driveway and asked me if I would like to study the Bible. Nobody had ever asked me that before. But as I began to open up the Bible, as I began to seek Jesus in this Bible here, friends, as I filled my life with Jesus, I was set free. One by one, all these things that had a slave that I was a slave to, uh, God just miraculously healed the shackles, just like what Peter just fell away. The iron doors that I had that I had walked myself into corners just opened up. God was able to do that because of prayer. Praise God for prayer. Now I thank God for a praying wife. It's a wonderful thing to have a wife that's praying for you. It's a wonderful thing to have a mother or dad that's praying for you. It's a wonderful thing to have a church family that's praying for you praying for you. But do you know what the most wonderful thing in the whole wide world is? And that's to know that Jesus is praying for you. That's right, friends. Right now, Jesus is praying for you. Jesus cares about you. What bothers you bothers Him. If there's something going on in your life, He cares about you, friends, and He is praying for you. Open up your Bible to John chapter 17. John chapter 17. One of my favorite chapters in the Bible. It's the intercessory prayer chapter of Jesus, the intercessory prayer. There is power in intercessory prayer, friends. I'm a product of intercessory prayer. The Jesus right here in John chapter 17, I'm going to be picking up at verse 1. Uh, the context here is Jesus is about ready to be offered up. These are the very final hours of Jesus right before Calvary here. Soon Jesus is on His way to the cross. Soon Judas will betray Him. Soon Peter will deny Him. Soon the, 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 the Roman soldiers will, cru will crucify Him until, until He is dead on the cross. And, and that's amazing. John chapter 17 and verse 1. These words, these words spoke Jesus and as He lifted up His eyes to heaven and said, Father, the hour has come. Now what hour is He talking about here? What hours is He talking about right here? The hours that the nails are going to be driven into His hand. The hours that these huge nails are going to be driven into His feet. The hour that the, the crown of thorns will be shoved down upon his, upon his head. The, the, the hour that, that he will be hung on that Roman cross. John chapter 17 and, and, and verse 1. Je Jesus spoke these words and lifted up his eyes to heaven and said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son that your Son may also glorify you. As you have given him authority over all flesh that he should give eternal life to as many as you have given him. And, and this is eternal life. Don't miss this, friends, here. And this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God in Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. Friends, think about this. That dreadful hour, that dreadful hour, Jesus was not thinking of the very fact that Judas, one of his very own, was going to betray him. He wasn't thinking of the fact that even his own disciples were going to deny, deny him and run for him. He wasn't thinking about the fact that he was just about, going, just about walking in to his suffering, to where he was going to be persecuted, beaten, and tortured. He wasn't even thinking about that. You know, I, w I would have been all over that. I'd probably been praying, God, now I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna go through this, but I don't want to feel no pain. Take away the pain. That's not what was on Jesus' heart. No, that's not what Jesus was, was thinking about. That's not what he was praying to his father about. You know what he was praying for the father about? That we would catch the life preserver. That that we that that he was praying. What Jesus was thinking about was he was thinking about you. And he was thinking about me. One thing more than anything else important to Him was us. Jesus was thinking about us. That we would take the time to get to know Him. Jesus says in John 12, 32, If I be lifted up, I will draw all men into me. Friends, we, Jesus, 
His used the love that's demonstrated from the cross of Calvary to draw us away from the grip that the world has on our life. To draw us away from the grip that, 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 uh, that this sin has on our life when we become prisoners, when we become chained and shackled to the, to the different, different worldly lusts that, that's out there right now. He's praying that we might get to know Him, that we would just take time to seek Him, that we just take time to, to pray to Him, to get to know Him, that, that, uh, that, that as we knock, uh, that, that He could open that door for us, as we seek Him, that we could find, as we search, that we could find Him. That's what was on His heart. That's what we were, that He was praying, praying about right there. That night, Jesus was praying for you, friends. That night, He was praying for you. Uh, John chapter 17 and verse 20, Jesus says in that, in that prayer, He says, I do not pray for these alone, but also for those who will believe in Me through their word. See, friends, Jesus was not only praying for those disciples 2,000 years ago. He was praying also for you, friends. He was praying for you. He was interceding for you. So what was, what, so what was Jesus' request from His Father? What for me and you, what was his desire? What was his, what was he was getting ready to go into Calvary? What was the very most important thing that was on Jesus' heart? He tells us in John chapter 17, verse 24, Father, I desire, I desire that they also whom you have given me may be with me where, where I am. The very most important thing to Jesus, the very, very, very most important thing to Jesus is, is that we could spend eternity with Him. Friends, I want you to know that Jesus loves you and He cares about you very much. Jesus, right now, right now, Jesus is pleading with His Father for you. Right now, you are on His mind. Yes, you were on His mind in the Garden of Gethsemane. You were. Right now, you can be for sure that you were on His mind when He was on the cross of Calvary. And right now, you can know that you are on Jesus' heart. Right now, He is in the heavenly sanctuary. Right now, pleading on your behalf. Right now, He is waiting on you to come to Him in prayer. Friends, the Bible says in Hebrews 7, in verse 25, that, 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 that wherefore He's able to save to the uttermost, for those that come to Him in prayer. To the uttermost, friends. Jesus is waiting on you to come to Him in prayer. He's waiting. He, right now, He's pleading the blood that He shed for you on the cross of Calvary. Right now, He's, he's, he's showing the Father the scars that He took for you because He loves you, friends. He cares about you. Jesus not only died to pay the price for our sin, friends. He died to give you power to overcome sin. But we've got to come to Him. We've got to come to Him and say, Lord, I need You in my life. He's just waiting on, on you to do that. You might say to yourself, because you know yourself better than anybody else, you might say to yourself, how in the world can I ever be saved? Because I know myself. I know what's deep down inside of me. I know my, how corrupt my heart is. I know how weak I am. When I, when, when I look at myself, I see absolutely no way that I could ever be saved. I'm just totally unworthy. But friends, when you look to the cross... When you look at the price that Jesus Christ paid for you on the cross, that how, what He was willing to go through just to save you for eternity because He wants to spend eternity with you, you say, There's, I see no way I could ever be lost. When God loves me that much that He was willing to endure the cross, when He was willing to go through what He went through to save me. Friends, it lets us know how much God loves us. Praise God that Jesus Christ is praying for you right now. I want you to know, I don't know what's going on in your life, but I want you to know that you can make it. I want you to know that you're going to make it. All you've got to do is turn your eyes upon Jesus. Give up on yourself and turn to Jesus. He cares about you very, very much. Right now, you need to know that God cares about you and He loves you. Yes, it, it is important to have a mother or dad or even a church family praying for you. But friends, knowing that Jesus Christ is praying for you, that He cares about you. This road that you're going down right now, it might be hard. It really might be difficult. And, and, uh, and you might wonder, how am I going to make it? But I want you to know that Jesus is in your corner. In, in Romans, in Romans 830, 8.31, uh, the Scriptures say, If God be for us, who can be against us? 
If God be for us, who can be against us? Philippians 4.13 says, I can do all things through Jesus Christ who strengthens me. All things, friends. And all things is all things. And, and a while ago when I read the scripture in Hebrews 7 verse 25, I said, wherefore, the Bible says, wherefore he's able to save to the uttermost. Friends, are you at the uttermost right now? Are you going through a lot right now? Do you feel beat up and discouraged? Do you think that it's just hopeless for you? Friends, I want you to know you have Jesus on your side. You have Jesus on your side and He can save to the uttermost. You and Jesus are victorious. You can do all things through Jesus Christ who strengthens you and He's inter interceding. You can never be lost. You can never be defeated by Satan when you're on your knees crying out to God to save you. Acts 2.21 paints a beautiful picture. It's, it says that there will come a day when whosoever, and that would be you, friends, whosoever cries out to the Lord shall be saved. That's a powerful promise, friends. Jesus loves you very much. Jesus loves you. You know, the Bible paints a picture in Jeremiah 29 about a God that has a plan for our life. And this plan involves peace, hope, and a future. And He tells us something in this Scripture. He tells us that, that, that He will reveal that plan to us when we search for Him with our whole heart. When we search for Him in prayer with our whole heart. Right now, friends, this Jesus that we've been reading about is waiting for you to come to Him in prayer. Waiting. Will you come to Him in prayer right now? Will you just give Jesus a chance in your life? Right now, just reach out to Him, friends. He'll never turn away from anyone that's reaching out to Him. Can I pray for you? Can I lift up a prayer for you, friend? Join me. Father in heaven, I thank you for this message of hope today. That, that we have a God that hears our prayers. That we have a God that cares. Maybe, maybe we have people out there that, that have children. That have strayed away. Or a loved one. Maybe a spouse. That, that just seems so far out there that it's going to be impossible to reach them. Father, please impress upon them that you can save to the uttermost. That, that when we pray, it gives you an opportunity to work in a powerful way. Just like you rescued Peter, would you go and rescue those that are being lifted up in prayer right now? I plead the blood of Jesus on everyone watching and listening here today, and I pray that you would work a miracle in their life, Lord, just like you worked a miracle in Peter's life, and just like you worked a miracle in my life. I know you can, Lord. And in Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen. God bless you. Thank you for joining us here in the, the beautiful New Life Ranch. Jesus loves you. And remember, the best is yet to come. Bye-bye.